Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Regen's first ever theology lab. So you've, you've made history. You're the very first uh, participants in theology lab. Odds are you probably care about theology more than the others. That's why you're here. Um, but so, so um, uh, my name is Stephen, if you don't know, uh, pastor at Regen. Very glad that you guys can, can be with us this morning. Can I, can I make a request? Because the odds are that it's unlikely that we're going to have a packed house. So it would be great if we can move forward and closer to each other and to, to um, I don't know, embody the fact that we're you know, one family in Christ. Sorry, Dan? Oh, you want to, do you want to sit in front? Yeah, come on. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to... Uh, let's start with a, a quick word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for our brother Ricky, who's come uh, all this way to share with us uh, the fruits of his labors in, uh, in historical theology, in the life and uh, theology of Jonathan Edwards. And we pray that you bless us through his, his service this morning. Uh, give us eyes to... See ears to hear um, and to more rightly grasp uh, what you have revealed about uh, conversion and revival through the work of this man, Jonathan Edwards. Thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, just a quick intro. Uh, if you've not met Ricky, we, um, we were both classmates at Bible College. We both studied at Ridley Bible College. It was a very uh, fruitful time experience together. Uh, interesting story about Ricky is there was in one class <clears throat> in um, I think it was first year um, that there was this lecturer who there was one there was one week where Ricky didn't turn up to class and uh, there's this lecturer I won't reveal the won't reveal the name of the guilty uh, kept referring to me as Ricky in class it was like Ricky tell us what do you pointing at me like what do you have to say <laughs> and uh, and I was too sort of um, I don't know why I didn't correct him. I think it's because I was too excited to answer the question that I was like, and it was quite a polemical thing as well. Like I was at odds with the lecturer. I was actually presenting a view that was opposite of his. I think, and so I think it was about women in ministry. And so we were kind of like clashing um, uh, to the point where, where at the end of the class, I was like, you, you, you desecrated my wedding Bible passage. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's the second thing. So, so the, the whole time, he's calling me, Rick, Ricky, say, yes, Ricky, tell, tell me what you think. So to his credit, you know, he was um, um, willing to continue to engage with me. And then the, the rest of the class was just laughing because he had no clue what was going on. Then at the end, the final break, he, someone told him, by the way, you know, Prof so-and-so, you know, he's actually Stephen, not, <laughs> not Ricky. All Asians don't look the same. And uh, no, they didn't quite say that. But then, but then, so then he goes, he comes back from the break and in an act of repentance, he writes on the, on the whiteboard, note on like massive words, note to self, Stephen is not Ricky. <laughs> so yeah, we, all, we always tell, tell that story. And, um, and after that, we, um, oh, actually, it's really weird. I wasn't the only one who had that experience, right? Like someone, el someone else was also mistaken for Ricky. So then we basically came to the conclusion that Ricky is actually the quintessential, the avatar of all Asian male theological students. <laughs> oh, you're the Adam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, you are in, if you are in Ricky, that means you're an Asian theological student. <laughs> but um, so that, that was really great. And then we had, a, we had a group of friends and we were all called the Rickies. Um, but um, that is nothing to do with Ricky's actual, uh, the reason why he's here today. Uh, he's here today because he uh, is someone who has studied deeply uh, the life and work of Jonathan Edwards. Um, Ricky began uh, his PhD in, in Edwards, um, but eventually had to pause. What was what was your what was your topic again? Edwards and was it the sacraments? No, Edwards. That was my research project. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Edwards, Edwards teaching on the sacrament, yeah. Oh, I was preaching a revelation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so for a time, Ricky served as the co-director of the Jonathan Edwards Center in yeah. of Australia. Oh, you still are. Oh my goodness, I gave a false uh, thing in the thing. You should have told me. I wrote former when you're actually still the current. Ah, oh, mate, you should have told me. 
I thought you stopped that. Okay, so he still is directing all of Australia in thinking about Jonathan Edwards. Sorry about that, Ricky. My bad. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, Ricky's um, originally from Indonesia. So, close neighbor of where I'm from, Malaysia. Um, and, yeah, definitely um, really appreciate Ricky's work in this area. Um, great to see um, young young theologians getting getting stuck into to the work and um, really excited to hear what uh, he has to say. Uh, and and also Ricky's uh, wife, Hannah, is here and also his son, Kai. So warm welcome to them. Yay. Um, and if there's any other introductory stuff that I haven't, haven't said, then you can, you know, add that in. But I'll pass it on to you. We'll go for about maybe like 40 minutes, have some Q&A, have a break. And then, so there'll be two, there'll be two sessions today. And um, yeah, with a break in between. Take it away. Good morning. I am the true and one, the only one, true and original Ricky. Um, <clears throat> it's it's always a pleasure to to talk about history and Jonathan Edwards. So thank you very much to um, for inviting me to talk about it. Um. So today we're going to talk about Jonathan Edwards, his conversion and his theology of conversion, how he understood conversion. That's the first part of um, our journey. And then the second part, and then we're going to take a break, and then the second part we're going to talk about the second half of his life and how he experienced revivals and how he understood um, revivals. So um, probably just a quick um, so next slide, just a quick, uh, um, yeah, just, just a quick story of how he was born into this world. So he was born in um, a, a small town in East Windsor um, in 1703, so in 1703, he was born in East Windsor, New England. So New England was one of the English colonies in the North America, so you can see that um, the English colonies in, in red, the rest was just um, France um, and Spain. So New England was one of the colonies. And the next slide. Um, this is supposedly um, the house where he grew up in. So Edwards was born as a part of a Puritan community um, that ran away from England. So if you know what happened to the Puritans, so basically after the Reformation in the 15, 1500s, um, England became Protestant, right? They, they broke away from the um, Catholic Church. Henry wanted to be uh, Protestant. Um, but then as time went by, um, a lot of people felt that the English church could have been more reformed, re more um, further reformed. So um, they didn't care about like the, um, the rituals of the Catholic church, the um, wearing robes and stuff like that. So they thought, why, why don't we just purify the church further and go back to the original gospel rather than um, care about all this excessive um, uh, wearing stuff and doing stuff, just stick to the gospel, right? So they were called the Puritans, these people that, that wanted to purify the church further. Um, and they were basically in England, the Puritans were um, isolated. They were, not, um, they were not accepted by the wider community because the wider community wanted to stick with the Anglican church. And so they ran away to... Um, North America, and established a, a colony called New England. And in this colony in New England, they, they could practice their own religion, the Puritan religion. Um, they could have their own law, um, which included, by the way, um, that all parents must um, teach their children how to read the Bible. And as, as a result of that, which is interesting, um, back then in the 1700s and 1600s, um, New England was probably the community with the highest literacy rate in the whole world because everyone could read, because everyone had to read the Bible. So <clears throat> it was pretty interesting. Um, Edwards was born 
Um, his parents were Timothy Edwards and Esther Stoddard. Now, th this will be um, significant later, as we, we will see. He was the fifth of 11 children, all of whom were women. So he, he was the only uh, man in the family, except um, for his father. And that would later um, significantly influence how he ministered. So he, when he ministered, he cared so much about women. So he, um, in the days when women didn't receive any education, he educated all his daughters along with his sons. He taught his daughters how to, uh, how to read and how to speak Latin, Hebrew, Greek. Um, uh, he taught them um, theology, and later when he became a uh, missionary to the Native Americans, he built a school for both boys and girls, which was virtually didn't exist back then, um, a school for girls. So um, being the only child of 11 with all daughters, uh, with all um, women, sort of influenced how he saw um, women in that sense. <clears throat> now, next slide. Esther Stoddard, his mum, was the daughter of Solomon Stoddard. So Solomon Stoddard was a, fi a figure of great influence back then. He was one of the most prominent fathers of New England Puritanism. He was known back then as the Puritan Pope of the Connecticut River Valley. Um, he was great. He, was, he wasn't great in the sense that he, his theology was great, but his influence was great in, in the sense that um, a lot of people listened to him, listened to um, Solomon Stoddard. Now, um, Jonathan Edwards studied at Yale College, and he entered Yale at just under the age of 13, Next slide. Which was normal back then. So uh, back then, um, boys would learn at home, homeschooled, and then at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, they would go to um, college, and then they would graduate at the age of 16, 17, and then went off to either ministry or some other jobs. Um, at college, he was disciplined with academic study, with meditation, with writing essays. Um, he published his first academic essay on spiders um, at the age of, I think, if I'm not mistaken, at the age of 16. Um, he was a great thinker at Yale. He was smart. Um, he was great with school tasks. But... That made him proud. So he was struggling during this time that he was at Yale. He was struggling a lot with pride. He thought that he was better than a lot of the other students. So he would scoff at the other students for partying and for um, doing things that were not related to study. And he was also proud because his grandfather was Solomon Stoddard. So next slide. Now, this... This, was, this proud uh, uh, feeling was significant because both his father and his grandfather, Timothy Edwards and Solomon Stoddard, were traditional Calvinistic Puritans, which means that they held the Puritan theology of conversion. And this is what they said, uh, the Puritan theology of conversion. The Puritan conversion had a few steps. First, you have to be convicted of your sins, and then you have to be humiliated, that is, you feel so depressed with your sins, and you feel that you don't deserve God's mercy, and then after that answers the regeneration, yeah? So you have to, con to be convicted of your sins, and then you have to be humiliated, fear God because you, you have sinned a lot, and then after that, your life is changed, your life is regenerated. Now, it's not only that... Um, so the Puritan conversion, conversion had these steps, and they thought that a conversion was not genuine if the person 
couldn't recall or tell vividly of the steps. So basically, everyone would go to the pastor and say, hey, pastor, I'm, I'm converted. I'm regenerated. Okay, tell me about your experience. Uh, on such and such day, when you were preaching, I feel convicted of my sin. And then after that, I was thinking about it at home, and then I felt like I was humiliated, and I felt like God was angry with me. But then I felt like the Holy Spirit was um, regenerating my whole um, soul. And then the pastor would be like, okay, that's genuine. That means you're regenerated. Welcome to the family. Now you can partake in the Holy Communion. Basically, that's what happened in the Puritan conversion, right? Um, and that's why if you study uh, Solomon Stoddard, Stoddard sermons were famous for their hellfire and brimstone kind of style because he wanted to create that sense of humiliation. When he preached, he wanted people to be convicted and he wanted people to be humiliated to the, to, to, to the extent that they were feeling that they were worthless so that they would seek God. Now, the problem is, because Jonathan Edwards was proud, he could never recall vividly of what happened. He could never recall when he was humiliated or whether he was humiliated at all. Now, that's a problem, right? The, grand, uh, the, the grandson of this famous Puritan preacher, uh, the son of the Timothy Edwards, a Puritan preacher, was proud, a great thinker, but proud and was not converted. In fact, the only sense of distress that Jonathan Edwards had felt was not about his, particular, his sin, but about God's sovereignty. So next slide. This is what, what he wrote. From my childhood up, <clears throat> my mind had been wound, that, that is, had tended. Um, my mind tends to be full of objections against the doctrine of God's sovereignty in choosing whom he, would, he, whom he would to eternal life and rejecting whom he please, leaving them eternally to perish and be everlastingly tormented in hell. It used to appear like a horrible doctrine to me, but I remember the time very well when I seemed to be convinced and fully satisfied as to the sovereignty of God and his justice in thus eternally disposing of men according to his sovereign pleasure, pleasure, but never could give an account how or by what means, this is the problem, never could give an account how or by what means I was thus convinced, not in the least imagining in the time of it, nor a long time after, that there was any extraordinary influence of God's Spirit in it, but only that now I saw further, and my reason apprehended the justice and reasonableness of it, however my mind rested in it, and it put an end to all those cavils and objections that had till then abode with me all the preceding part of my life. What's he saying here? What he's saying is that, uh, what he's saying is that, uh, when he was distressed, he wasn't distressed because of his own sin. He was distressed because he was struggling with God's sovereignty. So, and when he remembers um, that his mind was changed, but he, he can't remember why or how or when. And so he can't really tell the pastor or his father or his grandfather, hey, this is how it happened. He couldn't. He couldn't, he couldn't do that, right? So that's the problem. Um, but he, he could still remember that his mind changed. How it happened, he didn't know. But um, pay attention here that the focus is different. The Puritans' um, theology of conversion focused on the humiliation prior to conversion. Jonathan Edwards can't focus on the humiliation because he can't remember um, his humiliation, but he was convinced that his conversion was genuine. So he put his focus not on the, go back to the steps, please. So he put his focus not on the humiliation part, he put his focus on a different part of the conversion. This is what, what he says. Uh, next slide. This one. I have oftentimes, since that first conviction, the conviction that I had and that we have 
um, read, had quite another kind of sense of God's sovereignty than I had then. I have often since not only had a conviction, but a delightful conviction. The doctrine of God's sovereignty has very often appeared an exceedingly pleasant, bright, and sweet doctrine to me. Pay attention to how, how, he, how he describes it. It's, just, it's, like, it's full of sense, um, pleasant, bright, and sweet. An absolute sovereignty is what I love to ascribe to God. But my first conviction was not with this. The first that I remember that ever I found anything of that sort of inward sweet delight in God and divine things that I have lived much in sins was on reading those words, 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As I read these words, remember, he was... He was struggling with the doctrine of God's sovereignty, and now he's reading this um, verse about God's being, uh, God being a king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. And as I read these words, there came into my soul and was, as it were, diffused through it, a sense of the glory of the divine being, a new sense, quite different from anything I ever experienced before. Never any words of Scripture seemed to me as these words did, I thought with myself how excellent a being that was and how happy I should be if I might enjoy that God and be wrapped up to God in heaven and be, as it were, swallowed up in Him. I kept saying it, and as it were, singing over these words of Scripture to myself and went to prayer and to pray to God that I might enjoy Him and prayed in a manner quite different from my, what I used to do with a new sort of affection. So, Jonathan Edwards didn't feel, couldn't remember what happened um, during his, what he, was, he would call his conversion. So, his conversion didn't really fit into the, the traditional Puritan sense of like um, conviction, humiliation, regeneration. And so he had to form his own way of thinking through um, the theology of conversion. And he understood regeneration because of this. He understood regeneration as a new sense. Seeing God, tasting him, he is sweet. Experiencing, um, experiencing him, I want to be swallowed up in that God. So this is what's different in Jonathan Edwards' account of conversion. So conversion is about seeing God's beauty and the ugliness of sin. You see, for Edwards, sin blinds us, right? So... Um, if we imagine that sin is like poison, it kills us. If we drink it, it kills us. And then experiencing God is like milk. We drink it, it makes us grow. But sin blinds us into thinking that sin is actually milk and experiencing God is actually poison. Which means that we can't help but choose what we think is milk, sin. We can't help not to choose what we think is poison, experiencing God. And for Jonathan Edwards, when someone is converted, the eyes of the heart are opened and they can see God as who he really is, how beautiful he is. He, they can see God as milk, and they can see sin as poison. And when that happens, we can't help but choose what we think is milk, God. We can't choose but deny what we think is poison, sin. And this sort of puts an, a new sense to, what, uh, to the doctrine of irresistible grace. You know, tulip, right? Irresistible grace. And... and um, we often think that when we talk about irresistible grace, we're like, 
surely our, uh, God's grace is not resistible. That means God is forcing, uh, forcing, forcing us to, to, to take it. And God cannot force our free will, right? We have free will. But for Jonathan Edwards, the irresistible grace, it's not that God is forcing it, but it is literally irresistible because it's so beautiful. Which means that God doesn't have to force us. We want it because we can see that it's so beautiful and it's so delightful and it's so sweet that we have to want it. It's so irresistible that way. It's so beautiful. It's too beautiful to resist. And that's how he understood, he understood conversion. Conversion is opening the eyes of the heart so that we can see God is beautiful. He's too beautiful to resist. He actually used the um, illustration of honey. So, um, Stephen. If I want to say to you, right, I've never tasted honey in my entire life, right? And then I would like you to, but I don't want to taste it now. I don't want to try it now. I, w- I want you to tell me what, what honey is like. What would you say? Um, I'd say it's kind of like golden. Okay. It has, um, it's thicker than water. Yep. It is sweet. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, you, you know, this could take us hours, but... Um, how, is that di- how is that different to just syrup? It's sweet, it, it's... Yeah, yeah, oh, it's how different from syrup, it's not processed. Okay. Uh, is the taste different to syrup? Is the sweetness different? Yeah, yeah, it is. How? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See, so... Mm. So... Now that he, he tells me about honey, right? For someone, I have tasted honey, by the way. I love honey. But for, for someone who, who, hypothetically speaking, hasn't tasted honey, haven't tasted honey, um, I can't really understand. Like, I could sort of imagine what honey is like. I now have a little bit of understanding in my mind what honey is like. But I haven't tasted it. I haven't experienced it. And that's how Jonathan Edwards understood conversion. For people who, under, like, who understood God here, they're not really that... Con- then, Sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, people who understand God here in, in their minds, it doesn't mean that they are converted. Conversion goes way beyond just understanding God in academically. Conversion is about sensing God, tasting that he is sweet, um, seeing that he is beautiful, being swallowed up in him, experiencing him, just like the difference between if I just know honey and tasting honey. For Jonathan Edwards, conversion is the latter. That our, the eyes of our hearts are opened so that we can see him, we can taste him, and, and so on. So, I'm not sure if this is on the slide. Yeah, so this is what he says. Something is perceived by a true saint in the exercise of this new sense of mind in spiritual and divine things as entirely diverse or different from anything that is perceived in them by natural men as the sweet taste of honey is diverse from the ideas of men eh, the ideas men get of honey by only looking on it and feeling of it hence the work of the spirit of god in regener- regeneration is often in scripture compared to the giving a new sense giving eyes to see and ears to hear, unstopping the ears of the deaf and opening the eyes of them that were born blind and turning from darkness unto light. And so conversion is not only about knowing, it's about experience, experiencing a person, a relationship, 
And this is not only Edwards saying this. Edwards, along with other people during the evangelical movement in the 1700s, like George Whitfield, John Wesley, um, John Newton, um, they influenced our modern Christian ideas about conversion as experience, not only knowing about God, which is what um, uh, Jim Packer says, right? It's not just knowing about God, it's knowing God. Um, this is what, <clears throat> next slide, this is what um, George, George Whitfield says about his own conversion. A ray of divine light, you see, there's the, the seeing sense. Um, a ray of divine light was instantaneously darted in upon my soul. And from that moment, I, did I know that I must be a new creature. And then there's John Wesley. I felt my heart strangely warmed. It sounds a bit like the modern Christian pop song, doesn't it? Um, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. There are songs today that reflect um, this evangelical motives, right? Like amazing grace, you know, how sweet. There's that sense again, how sweet the sound. I was blind, but now I see. Um, even the, the modern rendition of it, the uh, broken vessels, right? I can see you now. I can see the love in your eyes. There, there's that sense of like um, new sense. Open the eyes of my heart. Um, there's a lot that we owe to these people, this, uh, the, this people from the evangelical uh, movement in the 1700s. And um, because, I'm not sure about the time, do we have, yep, um, because he was converted in that sense, that is, he sort of focused less on the um, humiliation part of conversion. He focused more on the change of heart, regener um, re uh, regeneration part of con conversion. His theology of beauty changed. He sort of was able to form a new theology, that is the theology of beauty. This is what he said. Um, after this, my sense of divine things gradually increased and became more and more lively and had more of that inward sweetness. The appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast or appearance of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellency, his wisdom, his purity and love seemed to appear in everything, in the sun, moon and stars, in the clouds, in blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, and all nature, which used greatly um, to fix my mind. I often used to sit and view the moon for a long time, and so in the daytime spent much time in viewing the clouds and sky to behold the sweet glory of God in these things. In the meantime, singing forth with a low voice my contemplation of the Creator and Redeemer. So, he was able to sort of create a theology of beauty from nature. He saw everything as beautiful because he, his spiritual eyes, so to speak, were opened and he could see not only the material things, but the spiritual beauty behind them. Everything pointed him to the beauty of God. This is what, what he wrote. So he basically wrote a full book um, full of how he saw spiritual sense, uh, spiritual things behind material things. So, for example, this one here. As thunder and thunderclouds, as they are vulgarly, vulgarly called, have a shadow of the majesty of God, so the blue sky, the green fields and trees and pleasant flowers have a shadow of the mild attributes of goodness, grace, and love of God, as well as the beauteous, beauteous rainbow. He saw, um, next slide, I think, I think there's one more example. The silkworm, 
is a remarkable type of Christ, which, when it dies, yields us that of which... Next sermon illustration. <coughs> yields us that of which we make such glorious clothing. Christ became a worm for our sakes, and by his death, finished that righteousness with which believers are clothed and thereby procured that we should be clothed with robes of glory. He saw the beauty of Christ and God and the gospel in every single thing in life. Um, and that's because he thought that conversion was about that. The opening of the eyes so that you could see that everything, wow, everything is beautiful. Not because everything is beautiful, but because behind everything is the beauty of the creator. Um, probably my last point or Edward's last point, is, um, is this. So, if you're wondering now, right, um, I can't see all this yet. I can't see the beauty of, in, of God in everything yet. But I'm convinced that I'm converted. I know that God loves me. I know that God and uh, Jesus died for me. But why can't I see the beauty of God in everything yet? Jonathan Edwards had the answer to that because he was also struggling with the same thing. That is, um, it's this. There's a difference between conversion and regeneration. So for Edwards, conversion was that point where um, the Holy Spirit opened the eyes of your heart so that you could start to see but regener regeneration was a lifelong journey. That is, it's like waking up in the, um, in the morning. The alarm, clocks, uh, the alarm clock uh, rings, and then you're like, uh, you open your eyes just, just a tiny bit, just enough so that you could snooze that alarm, and then you go back to sleep. And then that, that alarm rings again, and then you open... You open your eyes a little bit wider, but you're still like, uh, 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 and then you, you take coffee, and then your eyes open a bit wider again. It's like that. Regeneration is, a, a conversion is about seeing, opening the eyes of our heart, but regeneration is a lifelong thing. Often, we need to open our eyes a bit wider, and then our sinful flesh sort of, wants to close the, the eyes uh, a little bit, but then our, uh, the Holy Spirit wants us to keep up to, to open the eyes a bit wider again. And we see more, we see more, we understand more, we, we taste the sweetness of God more. And um, hopefully, eventually, when we see God, we see, not hopefully, certainly, when we see God, this is what Jonathan Edwards says, when we see God, we will see fully. We will know fully. We will taste fully. But that happens in the new creation. And, but uh, as long as we live in this world, that will be a battle. That is, it's a lifelong um, journey of seeing, not seeing, and seeing, and then not seeing. Which means that we need um, the Holy Spirit help constantly, daily, to open our eyes a bit, a bit wider and, 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 and um, f give us a brighter divine light, so to speak. So um, that's the end of the first part. First half of Edward's life and his theology of conversion. We will have um, some time to uh, have some coffee and think about it. Perhaps. Oh, sure. If you want, yeah. Okay, thanks, Ricky. Um, so before, before we break for, for um, uh, coffee, I think tea and coffee, uh, Paul's going to get some more, some more milk. Uh, we have some time for uh, Q&A, so we're, we're making, making good time. Um, so feel free to ask. I'm, I'm going to kick us off, if that's all right. That's fine. First question. So, so you know, um, regeneration, interesting doctrine, right? Because, you know, our church is named after it. <laughs> and, uh, and it, you know, understandably, it's been quite a, a, a doctrine that has been somewhat debated and had different views of it across church history. <clears throat> so... Can, can you can you flesh out a bit more um, uh, 
Edward's doctrine of conversion versus regeneration, because I think today we kind of use that language synonymously, right? Regeneration, conversion is like coterminous, the same, it happens at the same moment. And, and kind of the lifelong, um, that lifelong, I, I guess, seeing, increasing in seeing the divine light, it, we use typically the language of, of sanctification. sanctification. Although, interestingly, now people also push back against that and say, mm. you know, like the, what's that Aussie, Aussie scholar who wrote that book? Um, oh, I forgot his name, Mark Peterson, saying that, you know, in the Bible, typically sanctification is used to describe also um, the moment when you, you, uh, when, when, when God has made you his, that's why his book called Possessed by God. And, right. and, and really, the, you should, we should come up with another term like right. transformation or growth or maybe regeneration, who knows, right? So, so, um, so how, yeah, how do you, do, do you think that's right? That ba Edward's view of regeneration is basically what we call progressive sanctification now? Mm -hmm. or, is, or is it nuanced differently? Do you think we should all be more Edwardsian in how we understand, uh, use these terms, things like that? Yeah. Sure. Um, this is what's difficult when it comes to theological discussions. When you use words, and when you're um, debating, open, uh, debating opponent or um, conversational um, partner uses these words, you have to ask, what do you mean by that? Because different people mean different things. And um, historically, these theologians, even, they used words differently. So, for example, um, uh, Jonathan Edwards used the word regeneration for the lifelong changing, transformation, um, and conversion <clears throat> was that moment, was that one moment that's like, that opens the way to regeneration. Whereas John Wesley, which, which was alive at the same time, used the words differently too. Like he, he talked about sanctification more. Yeah, right. He didn't really talk about regeneration. He talked about sanctification. Um, sanctification as the, the journey part. And he was um, insistent that we could be perfectly sanctified, which was, yeah, which is also, uh, which opens another can of worms. But um, <clears throat> I think it's just a matter of um, uh, words and definition, Stephen. So if we can agree that there is that one event or one group of events that opened the way, that, that started the, the work um, of that lifelong, lifelong transformation, and then there is that lifelong transformation, and then there is that, at the end, there's that glorification. I think um, as long as we agree that there are those steps or um, paths, then... I think the words that we use are secondary. Um, yeah. If, does that answer your question or is that? Yeah, okay. Can I ask about, um, like, what's the place to, because, like, I was interested that um, John um, repentance, uh, believing in Jesus, uh, substitutionary atonement, <coughs> right. Yeah, context. So I think this is what I'm going to talk about in, in the next part. That is, <clears throat> um, we, we need to understand the context in the 1700s. So in New England, virtually everyone was a Christian, right? That is, they thought that they were Christian because they were brought up within the law. They were brought up reading the Bible and understanding what the Bible talked about. Jesus and God, they had to understand what the gospel meant. Which, which means that virtually everyone was a Christian. So um, repentance and knowing Jesus was less about um, you live your life without Jesus away and you now start living with Jesus. But it's more like 
you live your life that you think is under Jesus, but it's actually under sin, away, and you start actually living under God, if that makes sense. So, does it make sense? So, it's, it's different to how we, how we understand repentance now, because majority of the people don't believe in Jesus. So when they repent, they actually rep- it, it's clear for them that they repent to Jesus. Whereas back then, it was less clear because everyone thought, thought that they were Christian, right? So when they repented, it was more like our daily repentance, that we repent from our sin, even though we know that we are under Jesus, but we still live in sin. Um, and then we repent that way. Yeah. So... I guess when we read um, historical figures like this, we, we have to understand the, the context and how they sort of talked about theology the, uh, differently to, to us now. Yeah. It just sounds like in terms of conversion, mm. strange, it sounds like you look at something beyond what seems to me like the biblical... Mm-hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's my experience and how do I feel? Yeah. And that seems like kind of dangerous. <laughs> right, right. So, um, yeah. So, um, hmm. sure. That's, um, uh, man, that's. I wrote an in, an entire academic article on this, <laughs> so it's it's really hard. It's really hard to to summarize that. Um, faith, basically, for Edwards, is this: faith is not just again, it's not just believing here that Jesus is real or that Jesus saves or that. It's everything. But faith is way more than that. Faith is about trusting that person to the point that you um, you fall into that person. You, like he said, get swallowed up in him. You trust your entire self into his being, into his arms. That, that's faith. So faith is an experience. Faith is more than just, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, for him at least. Faith is like hugging. Um. <laughs> and so repentance, therefore, is not just like cognitively, I live my life of sins. Cognitively, I follow Jesus. But repentance is more like, I've been hugging this. I've been swallowed up in this life of sin. I'm living that way. I want to be swallowed up and hug this person that is God. So that's, that's repentance and faith for Edwards. And I think it's still... Um, Biblical, that is, there's repentance and faith to, uh, that saves. But for him, the saving faith is that kind of faith, if that makes sense. Yeah. But we probably have only time for one more question before the break. Um, just, I, I, might, I might just add, add to that, yeah, just quickly. The, we we kind of have a category for that, right? So, for example, like I've, I've evangelized lots of people in my life, and I would sometimes have people where they where they believe the person of Christ, they believe that he's God, they believe that he died, and they believe he rose again, right? They believe those things happen in history. But that may not make them a Christian because they're not, as you said, clinging, hugging, fully trusting in Christ. That it's, it's intellectual assent to a series of events, but they refuse to turn away from sin and turn to Christ. Um, and they consciously know that as well. The worst thing is if someone just has intellectual assent and they're falsely converted. And that's even more dangerous. Sorry, Mosh, you have a question? Yeah, I have yeah. a question about Edwards and Fiji. I think he and Edmund Fiji. 
Your team? Uh, there's one team that team has come through in your account of uh, getting the vision for him is his sense of God's unity and relationship. Mm. And the, the, I guess the regeneration of the heart is some sense away from um, seeing other things as beautiful and God is not. That, you know, to be sweet smelling aromas and eating God is mm. not mm. 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 I guess my question is in what way should that, does that idea or should that have been informed practices of beauty in the church? Because I think people use beauty in different ways. Many people use beauty evangelistically, for example, <coughs> lots of work into beautiful things. Um, I guess what would Edward's view of how God's, how this reorienting of life around God's beauty affects both church worship, for example, but also communicating? Does he try to communicate? Oh, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, this is another really big topic in Edwardsiana. Um, <clears throat> he didn't believe... Context, the Enlightenment, right? So the Enlightenment was big during this time, which means that um, a lot of people were starting to to study nature and the world. Um, and so they already knew, in a sense, that the world was beautiful, that the world was majestic, the world was huge, that it was worth admiring and studying. But for Edwards, that's not true light. That is, seeing those things as beautiful alone um, was not enough because these people were still blinded as to what is behind that beauty, what is behind those beautiful things in nature. Um, so even though in his sermons he did promote beauty, and he talked about grass, like the beauty of grass, he talked about the beauty of the sun, the beauty of the moon, the beauty of the stars and stuff like that. In his sermons, he did not expect that people could actually see what's beautiful behind them, except that the Holy Spirit regenerated their hearts. So, I'm not quite sure what, what you were asking in terms of like, yeah, that's... I think that was asking two questions. Yeah, yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think so. He, he, he won't do that. Yeah. Yes, yes. He, he won't do that. Um, so maybe his beautiful artwork and Christian music evangelistic. Oh, yeah, totally, totally, totally. So when he was um, a missionary in, in Stockbridge to the Native Americans, and, and, and he built that, that school to boys and girls, he insisted that um, these children were taught everything, music, mathematics, geography, astronomy, so that they could see that in these things there were beauty. And then after that, they were like, hey, you know this beauty here? It actually points us to God. So, so he did, in a sense, use that. Um, in, in evangelism or in, in his work to convert other nations. Yeah. Hmm. Well. All right, we might um, take a quick break there. Um, maybe let's see if we can do 10 minutes. Um, so thanks to Brinley, our multi-skilled um, helper today. He's going to not just run our live stream, but he's also going to help us make some coffee. Can I recruit someone? Naomi, can I recruit you to help Brinley out? Oh, awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, so feel free to grab a cup of tea or coffee, go say hello to someone you've not met before, uh, go ask Ricky more questions, and um, I also think uh, on a side note, I think I think Rob will be excited that uh, Ricky talked about the beauty of mathematics. So, <laughs> all right, enjoy.
Check test. All right. Brothers and sisters, we are about to restart, if that's all right. We can grab our seats. Um, and uh, if you have a hot drink, please uh, take every precaution. So as to not uh, spill it on the carpet. Um, all right, so uh, welcome back, and we've got Ricky is going to. Oh, we might need to restart this. Do we need to restart the stream? Um, I'll ask Brindley for Edwards and revival. Okay, so we've talked about Jonathan Edwards and his theology of conversion, right? So conversion is basically the opening of the eyes of the hearts so that we can see more and more and we can taste God and we can <coughs> experience him and we can have a relationship with him, get swallowed up in him, we participate in God's life. And revival, which is what, what we're going to talk about um, in a second, Revival is basically, it's a large amount of unregenerate Christians becoming regenerate. That is, they, they experience regeneration or they, they, um, they claim that they, they experience regeneration. But here's the question that probably follows from, from the first part of um, his life. What is the sign can we actually tell that someone is regenerated and someone is not? What is the sign of a conversion? And therefore, if <coughs> revival is basically a large amount of people being converted, what is the sign that a revival is happening? How do we know? That's the question that, that I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like you to, to put to the back of your heads so that we, we can, uh, as, as we go through... Edward's second half of life, um, we can start answering that question. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so, after he graduated uh, from Yale, Jonathan Edwards um, began his ministry. So basically, he went to New York for, to, to do ministry there, I think, for a year. Um, and then he went back and he started his ministry <coughs> at his grandfather's church. So where Solomon Stoddard was ministering. Um, and then he was ordained as a minister in that church in 1727, so when he was 24. Now, because that church where Solomon Stoddard was, uh, was one of the biggest and most influential churches in that area, Edwards was paid quite well. Um, he was... He got, his income was one of the highest in the whole New England. So in 1748, when he was 45 years old, just a few years before he was sacked, spoiler alert, he was going to be sacked, <laughs> um, um, his income was 800 pounds a year, which in today's money, that's equivalent to $250,000 Australian dollars a year. So that's pretty high for a minister in that small town, in that small colony, not even in England, but in um, the wilderness of America. Um, and Solomon Stoddard died in 1729, so two years after Edwards was ordained. Not because of Edwards, but, but because he was already old. Um, and during that time, New England sort of underwent a change of an era. So, like I said, the Enlightenment uh, influenced a lot of people during that time. Um, a lot of people had this high anthropology, so high view of human beings. Human beings were, were uh, not this puny 
cre sinful creatures anymore. So suddenly we were able to see the stars. We were able to understand how nature worked. So th there was this high, high view of human beings. Human beings were good, basically, uh, during this enlightenment. And then there's also deism. So a lot of people, because <clears throat> they could understand nature and they, they understood that, oh, actually, what's, what has been operating nature was not God all along. It's just the law of, laws of nature. It's been like this forever. So that's what they thought. So they, they adopted this view of deism that God created this world and then left it to, to laws of nature. And then there was also the rise of market economy um, during this time. So uh, a lot of people um, got comfortable in life, um, which was new, right, for this small colony in New England. For a um, hundred years, they had been toiling, and then suddenly they were a little bit more comfortable. <clears throat> now, um, nonetheless, in New England, there were no lands. So there was this population boom. A lot of people had a lot of kids, you know, like uh, Jonathan Edwards was one of 11 kids. I'm pretty sure a lot of people had more than 10 kids. Um, so there was a population boom, but as we see, can we go back to like the, the previous, 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 like the map, map of um, New England? So as we can see there, they couldn't go westward because there, there was the, France, uh, the, the French. So what they could do was nothing. They just sort of, um, they had these patches of land and then there, there was this population boom, but there were no lands left for them to actually settle. So what happened was um, a lot of young people during that time were late to get married because they couldn't go out of their father's houses, they couldn't get married, and they were late in adulting. Like, they, they, uh, yeah, but they were late in adulting. So um, there was this culture among young people, and by young I meant, I'm, I mean um, around 20s and, and 30s. Um, <clears throat> there, there was this culture of like, people co cohabiting um, among each other. Um, there was, next slide. Um, yep, and there's the, the tavern culture was booming during that time. A lot of people um, went to taverns, which is basically pubs uh, uh, at that time, um, drinking, partying, um, gambling, um, uh, young people partying on Thursday and Sunday evenings, which was back then seen as a rebellion because Sundays were, you know, the day, the day of the Lord, right? So they were partying on Sunday evenings and, and Thursday evenings. Young, people's, uh, young people were, were drinking and, and got drunk. So a lot of people saw that, a lot of the older generation saw that young people's lives needed some reformation or a revival. But <clears throat> let's stop there and consider what is a revival in that context. So, like I said before, everyone during that time was considered a Christian, except other peoples and other nations, right? So, the Native Americans obviously were not Christian. Only if, uh, very few people, uh, Native Americans, were Christians. They knew about the other nations, like the um, the Indians, the Indian Indians, not like Native American Indians. Um, who were Hindus, they knew about the Tur Turkish, who were Muslims. Um, but mostly in that small New England colony, they considered themselves as a Christian colony. So everyone was a Christian. And so there was no talk about evangelism. There's no evangelism, none. And when they reached those other peoples, the Native Americans, the um, Turkish and so on, with the gospel, they talked about, they didn't talk about evangelism, they talked about mission. They went on mission to somewhere else. 
And within that English community in New England, because there were no Christian and there were no non-Christians, there were only regenerate Christian and unregenerate Christians. So when these people were changed or converted, they talked about regeneration as, as we have um, talked about before. And when this regeneration happened in mass, it became a revival. That's basically what a revival is during that time. During Edward's ministry period, there were a couple of revivals. So there's the revival of 1734 and 1735, so when he was 31. Um, so in April 1734, this is how it happened. In April 1734, a young man in the congregation suddenly died. Um, just suddenly, like after being sick for two days, they passed away. And this young man was well known as an unregenerate person. Um, they like to party, they like to cohabitate and, and stuff like that. Edwards took this opportunity to preach from Psalm 90, 5 to 6. And he said this, Man is fitly compared to grass. Again, there's that use of nature to understand spiritual things. Man is fitly compared to grass that so often in the morning is green and flourishing, but in the evening cut down and withered. Basically what he's saying here is this. You young people, you, you're so confident about your life, you think that there will always be tomorrow there's this market economy booming, population booming. You think that there's going to be tomorrow. Your life is, your future is still far ahead of you. But man is like grass because you're flourishing and green now. Who knows? In two days, just like this person here, in two days' time, you'll die. Basically, that's pretty harsh, right? But that's basically what, what he preached. <clears throat> just a few days after that, Another young person died, but this time, this young person was well known in the community as someone who knew Jesus. Edwards preached. Again, he took that opportunity to preach, but this time with the good news that if someone dies, when they know about Jesus, it's, it's great news. They get to see, they get to experience God in the fullest sense. And then right after that, the young people experienced a revival. For some reason, just like, just like that, um, young people experienced revival. They were convinced, <clears throat> they were convicted that they were sinners. They repented. Um, they formed this youth fellowship on Thursday nights. Remember when they were partying on Thursday nights, now they went 360 the other way and formed a fellowship at church on Friday nights. Um, even the, the, um, the old, older people um, sort of were influenced by that revivals, uh, one revival, and um, formed another fellowship on, on Sunday night. <clears throat> the change in that city, in that um, Northampton, that's the city where he was ministering, was unbelievable, the change. Um, this is what, what he said. I'm not sure if it's there. Mm, no, not this yet. So go back. Um, he said, there was scarcely a single person in the town, either, either old or young, that was left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. Those that were wont to be the vainest and loosest were now generally subject to great awakenings. Every single day, his congregation would line up in front of his house to see him in his study for, to converse about, about spiritual things, which had never happened before that. <clears throat> um, outside of the church, um, spiritual conversations were the main topic if there, were, if there had been Instagram back then, it would have been like hashtag spiritual conversation everywhere. Um, 
This is what this is what's surprising. Sickness almost disappeared in that town. Like before that, Edwards would receive notes weekly, uh, prayer notes, or prayer request notes, like pray for us because we're sick with this, pray for us because we're, we're sick with that. And remember, during that time, like medicine was not as advanced, which means that um, mortality rate was high. A lot of people got sick, a lot of people died. And that's part of the reason why um, they had to have a lot of children, because a lot of children died. <coughs> um, but during this time, for a few months, he didn't receive any, zero, um, prayer notes for sickness, which was so surprising. And this is what he said, right? Next. Um, in the spring and summer following 1735, the town seemed to be full of the presence of God. It never was so full of love, nor so full of joy, and yet so full of distress as it was then. He was surprised that this happened just because of the two sermons that he preached. So um, he wrote about this account and he's, he, um, he told his friends about, about it. One of his friends, Benjamin Coleman, was curious about this phenomenon that he asked Edwards to write a fuller account. So Edwards wrote a fuller account and that writing was published as an appendix to a sermon by William Williams, which was a Puritan uh, preacher uh, back then. And then everyone, everyone read it, everyone wanted the copy, and then it was republished in London with a preface by Isaac Watts. Remember Isaac Watts? Um, the Amazing Grace. Yep. Yes, right? Amazing Grace, yes. Um, um, no, that's John Newton. Isaac Watts was the, when I survey the wondrous cross. Yes. Um, but he was also a, a father of the evangelical movement during that time. Um, so <clears throat> it was republished in London by a preface by Isaac Watts. It became popular. Um, and then it was republished as a book after that um, called the, next slide, The Faithful Narrative. A faithful narrative of the surprising, with a Z, Surprising work of God in the conversion of many hundreds, that, that's a really long title, of many hundred souls in Northampton and the neighboring towns and villages of Hampshire in New England. So, um, it was republished as a book in 1736. Now, from this book, we could get a glimpse of his sort of first development of his theology of revival. First thing that we can see here is that his theology, uh, when he thinks about revival, he thinks of it as completely the work of God. It's a, it's a, it's a surprising work of God, which means that even though, how, how did it happen? Well, someone died, he preached, another person died, Within a few days, he preached. So he thought that he didn't have any control over these events. What he did was he seized that opportunity, each opportunity he seized, so that he could participate in God's work. But it's entirely, entirely a surprising work of God. So that's the first thing that we can know from, from his theology of revival. He thought that revivals were... God's work. When I talk to people <clears throat> that I study about Jonathan Edwards, one of the um, questions that people like to ask is this. How can we do it again? How can we bring the Great Awakening, which, spoiler alert, will, will happen later, or a revival again in Melbourne? And I always say, if you would ask Jonathan Edwards, he would have said, nothing. It's not what we do that causes it. 
it's completely the a surprising work of God. What can we do? Only one. We pray for him to work surprisingly. That's it. And that's what he did later after the Great Awakening. Um, so that's the first thing, right? Re- revivals were completely God's work. And second, <clears throat> from this book, we know that um, for Edwards, revivals were movements of the people. So they were not caused uh, by the high uh, people in high power. They were movement of the people in the populace. So in the writings, for example, in, in that writing, in that book, two personal stories were published. <clears throat> um, the story of the conversion of Abigail Hutchinson and the conversion of Phoebe Bartlett. Both of whom, first of all, were women. Back then, women, didn't, uh, women had little role in public life. The fact that Edwards used women's stories showed, first of all, that he um, respected women, like I said before, and second, that it's really the movement of the lowly movement of the, the populace. It wasn't like caused by the people in, the, in, the, um, in influence. <clears throat> and also, second, Phoebe Bartlett, one of the people um, in the stories, was only four years old. Which means this. This is so significant back then because back then, there was a hierarchy in the society. God, government, pastors, parents, children. Which means that children were never thought as people who were capable of understanding spiritual things. They were never capable. In fact, Children were never baptized, uh, not, not baptized, sorry. Children were baptized back then. Ch- uh, infant baptism was, was a thing. Sorry, Stephen. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just telling off a fact here. Um, infant baptism was a thing back then, but um, uh, they, they never took the Holy Communion because they, they were never thought as people who were capable, or, uh, capable of understanding spiritual things. They were never thought as people who were capable of conversion because conversion meant understanding spiritual things for them. And so when when Edwards wrote that Phoebe Bartlett, this four-year-old child, was converted and it's a model conversion in the book for everyone else to see and read, it says something. That is, it's the movement not only of people, but also um, it's something that is capable of uh, overthrowing the whole society's expectation, basically. That's what, that's what he's saying. <clears throat> um, and also, third, that's the second thing. That is, first, it's God's work. Second, it's the movement of the people, the lowly people. Third, um, revivals, uh, this particular revival, confirmed Edward's theology of conversion. Because, as he observed, people experienced little, if any, humiliation or terror prior to their conversions. They suddenly just became they understood and they saw God's beauty. Unfortunately, <clears throat> before this book was published, it was uh, published in 1737, in London, in Northampton, the revival disappeared. Um, people went 
uh, people back backslided, backslid, backslided, backslid to to um, the fleshly realm, fleshly desires. Um, <clears throat> so he was concerned, but that book. Um, was published anyway in, in 1737. The Faithful Narrative was read by John Wesley and George Whitfield. Next slide. <coughs> John Wesley, George Whitfield. And um, this book, surprisingly, um, sort of burned their patience, their, their passions. So in 1739, <coughs> they went, uh, Whitfield went to New England where Edwards was. And he became popular, right? He became popular. He preached not in churches, but openly in fields. And again, that sort of shows that um, this is the work to, of the populace, not, not formally to the, of the people of influence. And um, so, next slide. So he preached to everyone, like beggars, uh, Farmers. He preached to everyone, not in churches, but openly. <clears throat> um, he preached, um, his style was extemporaneous uh, preaching, spontaneously. There were no notes. He, um, he was trained in the, um, in the theater, so he preached charismatically and loudly and theatrically. Um, he role-played all, all his illustration. There you go, Stephen. Role-play next time. <laughs> Um, once, um, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, but um, <clears throat> um, someone heard him uh, preach and then he um, uh, uh, someone heard him preach in front of 8,000 people uh, without a microphone. So 8,000 people without a microphone and everyone, even the back of the crowd, heard him, so it was, it was phenomenal, like uh, George Whitfield, right? It was, he was phenomenal. Um, so Edwards heard about George Whitfield, so he wrote a letter in February, February 1740 to invite Whitfield to come to Northampton. Hey, why don't you come to Northampton? Start a revival here, right? <coughs> you've, you've read my, uh, my letter, uh, my, my book of what happened in 1734 and 1735, but unfortunately, it was the revival disappeared. Start a new one. So, in 1740, <clears throat> um, he invited Whitfield. Whitfield came every single time he preached. People cried, and got converted, or at least they claimed that they were converted. Right, which again goes back to our original question: What? How do we know? Um, so, um, the fire of the revival went bigger and bigger uh, after Whitfield left in New England as, as uh, a few people sort of picked up that, that momentum, including Jonathan Edwards. <coughs> um, in summer 1741, a year later, Edwards, next slide, Edwards preached this really popular sermon. Um, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Note that unlike um, his grandfather, Solomon Stoddart, who was so big in like fire and brimstone, you go to hell if you don't, if you don't um, uh, uh, believe in Jesus sort of stuff. His sermons were more into like the joy of God, heaven is the, uh, the world of love, yeah, stuff like that. But... Um, in this particular uh, sermon, he talked about hell. So he's like, man, you're like a spider that is um, above fire, and only the hand of God is under you. And if, if ever the hand of God sort of, um, so if ever God lifts his hand up, you, you'll go to hell, like just straight away, like any, any minute now. So um, he preached that in Enfield, which is, so he preached that in Northampton, no effect, in his own congregation, you know, like prophets are not are not um, respected in in their own um, hometowns. <clears throat> and then he preached the same sermon in Enfield. Uh, 
He never finished. He never finished the sermon because in the middle of the sermon, literally everyone started screaming and crying and shrieking, saying, I'm a sinner, what do I do to be saved? So, this, this was the start of the Great Awakening with Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and a few other people um, starting through open field preaching. And it's called the Great Awakening, not only because, it, because it, it's, not a revi- it's not a local revival in Northampton. It's, it also happened in England, in Scotland, Germany, at the same time. Fires of revival in different um, parts of the English-speaking world. And Germany. Um, and I think um, in, in other countries around Germany as well. <clears throat> now, the problem is this. The Great Awakening was not all positive. The Great Awakening, um, Whitfield particularly, um, caused sort of a split in the church back then. And that's because, because Whitfield sort of started this culture among the regenerate people that they could and should judge those others who were not regenerate. So, and this sort of overthrew the entire um, societal structure, right? So um, a, lo- a lot of children rebelled against their parents because, well, Abigail Hutch- Hutchinson, uh, sorry, not Abigail, um, it, w- it was H- Abigail, wasn't it? Uh, Phoebe, Phoebe. Phoebe Bartlett, who was four years old, could be um, uh, convicted and, and uh, regenerated. I am too. Dad and mom, you're not. You'll go to hell. I'm going to heaven. So there's like this rebellious culture um, uh, being produced by the Great Awakening. Um, students at Yale were influenced um, Students started <clears throat> saying that their professors were unregenerate. In fact, um, one student said, these professors here have no more grace than this chair. <laughs> so <clears throat> so um, it was the, the, the culture of rebellion. Um, wives started uh, leaving their families so that they could preach in, in the open field, um, which which is interesting because Edwards talked to some of these women and they were like, and he was like, I'm completely open to you preaching in the open field as long as you don't abandon your family. So he's, he was, again, pretty, um, pretty pro um, um, women in ministry, uh, which is surprising back then. <clears throat> um, so um, during this, this time, there were two parties, old lights, what they were, and the, and the new lights. So the old lights were the people that followed the old way of Puritan thinking that were against revivals <clears throat> and pro-society structure. And they were like order. God loves order. If it's not, uh, if this particular work uh, overthrows order, that means it's not work of God. And then there's the new lights, which are like, Pro um, revival. Next, next slide. So this is um, an, this is evidence that we can see right now. Um, so in, if you go to uh, to Yale, there are only there are there are these two churches here that that have been around since that time. Um, both of them, I think I, I'm not sure what. I think it's the Church of New Haven or the first Church of New Haven. I think it's something like that. Um, both of them have the same name, and that's because one was the original church, and then some congregation thought that they were more enlightened, they were more regenerate than the others, so they split, and they formed another congreg- another church right next to it, <laughs> calling themselves the same name. And apparently there, there, there were a lot of churches that, that did this during that time because there was the split, right, between the old lights and the new lights. 
And <coughs> the split was because of this. It's an understand, a different understanding of human anatomy. So the Odalites believed that humans were basically, the, the psychology of humans were basically like this. There's this mind, the mind, there's the heart. Um, they understood the anatomy in terms of height. The mind is higher than the heart, than the heart. and so um, it's a prioritize, they prioritized intellect over emotions and experience. And um, uh, in, in the same way, they prioritized order, society order, over um, basically experience. Um, and so they thought, Religion cannot be based on experience and emotions. Religion has to be based on the intellect, on, on, on knowing um, um, something. So the, <clears throat> there are the, the old lights, whereas the new lights, they understood the human anatomy in terms of depth. The heart is deeper than the mind. So to, um, to, um, to be to, to experience God, you have to understand him first, but then you have to go deeper and let God touch your heart. And so they prioritized emotions and experience over intellect. So there was this split, right? And the, the split, again, the split is not just because of um, a different understanding of, uh, of sociology or politics, but because of different understanding of theology or Psychology, but psychology didn't exist back then. Um, it's, it's, it's purely theology. Now, Jonathan Edwards came <coughs> and said, actually, you're both wrong. So, <laughs> so, um, so he prioritized affection. And affection meant uh, for him the movement of the whole soul according to the will or according to the desire. And so for him, it's like when a person sees and knows God and tastes him, they desire God, and then their will moves the whole soul, their mind, their heart, everything, not only to the intellect, not only the emotion, but all the soul towards God. <clears throat> so... Um, he wrote uh, this, this book here, Distinguishing Marx, in 1741. <coughs> um, yep, Distinguishing Marx, uh, which was originally a, um, a lecture. So he came to, to Yale during all this ruckus, well, dur during all this chaos. He came to Yale, and then he did a lecture on this, Distinguishing Marx of a Work of the Spirit of God. And he said this, outward phenomena associated with the revivals, crying, groaning, shrieking. Um, some people were barking during sermons. Um, so outward phenomena associated with the revivals neither prove or disprove the genuineness of the revivals. The Holy Spirit is free to do something extraordinary or unusual but that doesn't prove that the work is not from God or from God. And so the, this is what he wrote there. Next slide. The end for which God pours out his spirit is to make men holy, not to make them politicians. Which means, like, I don't care about order or, like, you know, um, the, the order of the body or the order of the society. God pours out the, his spirit not to make men politicians, but to make men holy. Edwards warned those who were so against the revivals that they might be blaspheming the Holy Spirit by calling this work demonic, if it's not. So the old lights believe that God will not do any work that destroyed order, but Edwards said... God is free to do anything. So this is what he said. Next slide. God in this work has begun at the lower end of the society 
who are you to say otherwise, that the, that the work of God has to begin with the high of the society? We should not dictate how God works. But at the same time, in the same um, uh, lecture, he was also warning the new lights, the new lights, not to see the genuineness of conversion just from its physical phenomena. You think you're crying and you're shrieking and you're doing all this and therefore you're converted? You're wrong. So from his experience of 1734-35, right? We know this, that many of these experiences were false. Like he had experienced a revival in his town in Northampton in 34-35, uh, but then it waned, it, it disappeared afterwards. So he didn't trust the outward appearances of revival. So he said this, Next slide. I had rather enjoy humble joy in God one quarter of an hour than to have prophetical visions and revelations for a whole year. And so he warned them, these uh, this new lights, against their pride that comes from the feeling that God is talking to them through excessive signs. And thus, they were not listening to others um, they were not listening to critics, they were not listening to reasons, and they judged others. So Edwards was like, old lights, you're wrong, new lights, you're wrong. <clears throat> Edwards wanted to see the work of God as the work of God and not from its outward appearances. <clears throat> um, so here we see that Edwards moved from when he was in, in 1734-35, he was so embracing of a revival, but then he felt like he got tricked, and it's like, well, this revival didn't actually last. So at this time in 1741, he was a bit careful overall, and he followed his revival with a strategy. He asked himself, how can we make sure that these people who, who claim that they're um, converted don't backslide and, um, like they did in, this, in, in 1734 and 35. So this is what he did. Um, next slide. In 1742, a year after that, he started a church covenant. If you think, if you claim that you're converted, sign this covenant. So basically the covenant is this. I, uh, uh, we promise to fast um, every, I don't know, month or something. I promise to, to pray regularly. I, I promise not to use uh, the freedom in Christ for lust to cohabitate and so on, which was, um, as, as I've said, which was um, popular back then. I promise to have um, uh, healthy and, and spiritual relationships and friendships and stuff like that. Um, uh, promise to be serious in religion, promise to be serious in partaking in the communion. So basically he followed, like, you're, sure, you, you claim that, that you're um, converted. I can't tell for sure. You've tricked me before. So here's the covenant. Sign it. <clears throat> but um, pay, it, uh, pay closer attention, right? Like, it's... This covenant didn't come before conversion. It's not like he's like, you sign this because you're already part of the church, regardless of whether or not you're converted. No. Um, this covenant comes after they claim that they're converted, which means that it's a way not to discipline them before conversion, but it's a way to prove their fruit after conversion. <clears throat> and then he also wrote in 1746, um, I don't think there's um, any on the slide, but it might, next, what's, what's the next slide? Nope, let's go back. So uh, he wrote again in 1746 another book called Religious Affections. This is the most conservative of all um, his writings on the revival. He lists... In this book, um, signs of true grace, 
He basically says, these signs here, shrieking, crying, um, all the trembling of the body, blah, 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 these are not signs of um, that there is true grace or not, as, if, uh, as in um, he's saying that th these signs don't tell anything about anything. But he's saying these are the positive signs of true grace. That is fruit in Christian practice. You love the Bible more. You love God more. You love others more. So he, over the course of several years, when he was um, experiencing and struggling with different revivals, he sort of developed slowly um, his theology of revival from being so open to it to being careful with it to being sure you can claim that you're converted you're revived you've experienced revival but these are the only signs that you're actually converted you love God more you love other people more you love the word of God more And um, in 1747, after that, in, in a year after that, <clears throat> he started a concert of prayer. So it's a global movement. Um, he, along with other pastors in England and Scotland, he started a prayer to sort of um, pray to God to continue his work of, of um, converting these people. So that's the, uh, his theology of revival. Um, just probably just quickly, I'm going to just um, quickly walk you through what happened um, at the end of his life. So after um, the revivals, he was involved in this um, controversy. It's called qualifications controversy. Basically, he and his church were struggling with the question of who should partake in the communion. So his church... Because of his grandfather before, before him, his church believed that um, everyone could partake in the communion, whether or not they regenerate or unregenerate, whether or not um, they were baptized or not baptized, whether or not um, it's an open communion. Whereas Edwards, because of his theology of conversion, uh, conversion is about seeing, he thought that, no, um, Holy Communion is a partaking, it's a... It's, uh, it's an experience, it's a relationship with God in the Holy Communion, and therefore it's only for those who are actually experiencing God. So he got caught in that controversy, and therefore he got sacked in 1750 when he was 47. After that, he went on a mission to the Native Americans, in Stockbridge, which I've told you about. He opened a school for Native American boys and girls. Next slide. I think that that's the house where his, he and his family um, stayed in, in Stockbridge. I think he had, he had like 13 children or something like that. Um, um, his grandson became the third vice president of America. Um, Everyone in the family was educated and, and, and took high positions in the society. <clears throat> and then he became, a, uh, after Stockbridge, he became a Princeton uh, president, so president at Princeton College back then, not Princeton University, in February 1758. So February 1758, he became a president at Princeton. March 1758, one year after that, he died because... Um, there was this smallpox inoculation, like a lot of the scientists there, they were, there was this outbreak of smallpox, and then the scientists were, work, the doctors were working through um, this uh, vaccine. He was so pro-science, because he could see, you know, the beauty of nature. He was so pro-science that he was like, I would like to be a, te a, a, a test uh, object. So he got inoculated, it killed him. Um, so that's the end of his life, and that's the end of our study. <laughs> uh, so
so we've gone a bit over, so we don't actually have time for uh, Q&A, but um, so let me just close the time. Ricky, if you feel happy to stay on for a bit longer, maybe you can take some more questions, but let me just officially close uh, the time now. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Ricky and also for Hannah and Kai, and we just pray that you continue to bless him in his study of Edwards, uh, continue to, to bless his family, bless him as he um, leads his family, um, as he grows in his own regeneration, uh, and as he seeks to live out <clears throat> the truths that he studies uh, so deeply. We pray that you continue to use him um, as a gift to your church, uh, that his uh, study will bear much fruit um, that strengthens the church here uh, in Indonesia, wherever you call him to serve, Lord, for your glory and the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so, uh, yes, Mosh. Can we call it a theology of revival or is it a series of retreats from positivity to caution? Like, right, okay. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, so just to be clear, yeah, if you need to go, you can go. We're finished officially, but this is the post session now. Okay, right, Ricky. Yeah, yeah no, no shame in going. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, I would still call it the theology of revival, like his theology of revival, but it, it's true that he was wor working through his theology of revival through his, his, his experience. So, <clears throat> with his theology of conversion, he sort of formed it in, ret in retrospect. He looked back to his experience and then he's like, hmm, it doesn't quite fit with the Puritan theology of conversion. Here's my take on it. Whereas with theology of revival, he sort of slowly developed it as he experienced revivals. Um, yeah, but, but you're right, it's... Um, I, I would still, still call it his theology of revival. I don't think he wrote a particular book on a theology of revival, but these three books um, he wrote as he was um, reflecting on the revivals that he was experiencing. All right, if anyone's super keen, I've got to say before, before you run off, I've got this book here uh, of, um, that, that is more, not all of the books that you listed, but... Narrative of Surprising Conversions, Distinguishing Marks. Then there's a third one, which is an account of the revival of religion in Northampton. Maybe that's just a paper or something. So all of the things that he mentioned other than religious affections, so if you want to borrow it, first person to claim it from me, you can borrow it and how long you need. But uh, cool. Any other fi final questions? Aaron? So, it's a, I guess it's a question of priority. Do we, so the old lights prioritized the intellect, right, over emotions and experiences, whereas the new lights were the other way around. They, the new lights exper um, um, uh, focused on the, on the experience and emotions. Edwards wanted to see the whole psyche, the whole soul, as one. Intellect and emotions, they're actually one, but he talked about another um, force, that is the will. So he also wrote, um, by the end of his life, he wrote The Freedom of the Will. That's also another book that's, also, that's really philosophical. But um, <clears throat> he introduced an, another force, this, uh, force here, that is the will, and the will sort of moved the whole soul. And that movement was, um, he called that affection. So affection is not emotion, like, like what, how, we, how some people understand it now. Affectionate, you know. Um, but affection for him was the movement of the whole soul. 
that was driven by the will. And because the will um, uh, went to whatever the soul desires. So if we go back to the milk and poison again, we desire milk and, and we think that God is milk, then our will drives our, our whole soul into God. If we desire sin, because we think that sin is milk, then our will um, drives our whole soul. Our intellect and our um, heart drives the whole soul into uh, to sin. So basically that's what he's doing. He's like, you're barking up, barking up the wrong tree. You're focusing on the difference between um, the intellect and the emotions as if they're, they are separate. No, the whole soul is the whole soul. And we're moved by our will according to our desire. So he, what, um, the, the point is, um, in the debate, <clears throat> he was sort of, what he was saying was that um, whether you're focusing on intellect or whether you're focusing on, on emotions, these are not signs that you're actually converted. The sign that you're actually converted is that if you desire God more, if you desire to love him more, if you desire to love um, his word more, if you desire to love others more. So basically that's what he's doing. Yeah, <laughs> that, that goes to a, a psychological, yeah. Um, the desire is a part of the soul. I think he would say that desi the desire is part of the soul, but the desire is the, is the thing that the Holy Spirit affects, or the Holy Spirit changes when he regenerates the soul, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so I, I think um, if I were to reword him, this is my interpretation of him, right? Um, I would say this. <clears throat> For the, the old lights, when someone is regenerated, they will know more about God. For the new lights, if someone is regenerated, they will feel they will experience, they will feel fear and shriek and cry and stuff like that. Whereas for, this, for God, eh, for, for God, sorry, Jonathan Edwards is not God. For Jonathan Edwards, um, it's, not the, it's, not the, um, it's not the mind or the emotions that, that the Holy Spirit changes. It's the will. The will, of the desire, sorry, the desire that drives the will, that drives the whole soul. If that makes sense. Yeah. No, affection is the movement of the whole soul according to the will. Hmm. Can, can I try to clarify? So, so would you then say that Edwards hmm. has an, uh, uh, his own, <coughs> or there's some order in his anthropology as well, where either views deeper or higher the kind of most core, maybe the most core thing is the affections, and that drives the the, the intellect and the emotions, right? So if your desires, mm. your affections are mm. changed, mm. that will mean that you also would want, you're driven to know more about God. That's true. And you're, you're, you're driven, driven to, to experience, experience yes. God. So there is also an order where it's not that the desires equals the mind and emotions. They're if I can distinguish them, mm -hmm. three separate things, but one affects the other. Yes. So this is a very sort of city to city thing as well, Tim Keller thing as well, where um, we would pre credit um, Edwards and, and it's quite Augustinian as well, mm. uh, although maybe there's different nuances in Edwards. And so one of the helpful ways that we, we try to, 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 to think through this at, um, in a Tim Keller city to city context is, in Australia anyway, is we think of different organs and think, what does, uh, and, and attach a verb to the organ, right? So, what do minds do? They think, right? Um, and then interestingly now, in kind of the, kind of our modern world, 
we equate the heart and we say the heart feels. That's kind of the modern. But that's not what the Bible uses. Mm. That's still not the organ that the Bible uses, right? Did anyone have a clue what organ does the Bible use to, 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 to describe feeling? Bounce. Bounce, yeah. And we still kind of have, we kind of still have that. We in, have the gut feeling. Yeah, exactly. We still have this in English, right? We say, oh, I feel it in my gut. Or I've got a gut feeling about this, mm. da, 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 right? So we kind of still have that. So, but the guts, the guts are what feels, not the not the heart. Mm. But then, so so what what verb do you think you could um, use to to connect to the to the heart? Leaves? No, not leaves. Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sense, yeah. So, so I, I would say, we would say that I think our default answer is the heart loves. Loves. But what does love mean? It is in an Edwardian sense, right? So the heart, um, you know, desires, clings to, hugs. Right, hugs is a new one for me. I'm gonna really <coughs> use that. The heart hugs. The heart gra gra grabs. You, you know what I mean? Like the the. Another helpful way to think about it is, uh, if you think of a heart. Um, hearts do not function without an object. So that means that if you can p picture a heart with an arrow coming out of it, hearts are always directed at something. We're, 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 I, I, I don't think it's possible for a human to not have their affections. Or another way to think of it is worship as well. What's worship? Our, our affections directed at something or someone. I think if, if there's not, I think probably we'll, we'll be suicidal. Like, and so, um, so I think that's the most core of our, our being. But I guess it's interesting when I hear your description because it sounds to me that the will is also really key to that as well. Because um, you always, you, the way you described it a few times was desires that drive the will. Mm. Because for me, the, the will is also different in, in, our, in the way that I've thought of it is because the, the will is... <coughs> Um, a tr is the a volition a, to choose to do something right. right so for example you might say um, try harder or you know you might tell someone hey stop watching porn or you know go to bed early or you know you might tell someone to do something and they might try by the force of their will and they might you know all right I'm gonna set my alarm or I'm gonna like turn off my like not use my computer you know what I mean like people might try to do something from a force of will but that's not the same, I think. Uh, you tell me what you think. I don't think that's the same as doing it out of a heart that's been transformed with, with your affections being transformed, your loves. So the reason why you're going to do all those things because it's not because ah, I'm going to grit my teeth and, and like try harder, but because your love for God is greater than your love for lust or, or I don't know why people are driven, you know, kind of go to sleep on time, but whatever that... that um, that that is driving that. I don't, I don't know whether that's uh, in line. No, no, that, that's. Um, I think that's a nuance of it. Um, Edward will, Edwards would say that if 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 you don't really desire it, then you don't will you don't really will to to go there. So I guess it's more like we're pulling a card, right? The will is like it's like the rope that pulls. The desire is like the person that pulls yeah, it. Yeah. And then the card is like our whole soul, the heart and the mind, and, and the heart and the mind. So, so it's like if we we get told stop um, watching porn, for example. But if the the desire still wants porn, then we we can't really do it because we we don't really will it. If if, if Jonathan Edwards would, would say that, yeah, yeah, um, yes, but it's interesting. <clears throat>
mm. leads me to pursue a career and to do all this thinking and learning and feeling about that and all those things slot into place. But mm. they're all, even how I'm, we think, you know, particularly enlightenment people think that everything's just this autonomous right. mind yeah, yeah, yeah. spinning in the wheel tube yeah. based on that. But so much of how people end up living is the mind rationalizes yeah. and the emotions, yeah. you know, all of this stuff that we think is That's a right. and misses the peace. Yeah. Yeah, which is what, what James Smith says, like, you are what you love, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you think of this quote from um, uh, Cranmer, which is the, the heart, you know, this one, the heart loves, whatever the heart loves, Yeah. the will chooses and the mind justifies. The mind justifies. I like that one, the mind justifies. The guts feel good about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The guts feel good about it. So, so he's saying that the, 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 the similar thing, right? The, the heart is the, the starting point, the heart yeah. loves. Yeah. Will yeah. Pro probably, yeah. I don't know much about Cranmer, but I don't know the context, but it pro probably. Oh, yep. He answered that in, in that really thick book called Freedom of the Will, which he wrote, um, I think, one or two years before he, he died. Um, he was so pro of our freedom, our free will. That he was so pro of like, he was a Calvinist, but he was so pro that we, we have the freedom to choose. Um, basically, going back to my to my um, earlier illustration of like milk and poison. That is, our will is always free to choose what we desire. But sin blinds us into thinking that sin is good and God is bad, and therefore we freely, freely choose sin. But at, on the on the one hand, we freely choose sin. On the other hand, we can't help but choose sin because we see God as poison. Do you get it? So, so when the Holy Spirit sort of opens our eyes and then lets us see, hey, this is the reality. The reality is that sin is poison. God is milk. At that time, we, again, we freely will it. We freely will we, we freely choose God because we desire him, because we see him as milk and not poison. But also, on the other hand, it's completely the work of the Spirit to change us that, uh, to change us to, 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 to desire that. So I guess the modern... Um, I'm not sure if the modern... If you would say, Stephen, that the modern... Um, equivalent of that is compatibilism, but yeah, like God and us, it's 100% us and 100% God at the same time, it's com uh, compatible, but yeah, I think that's what he would say. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's both. Um, pray to God to, to open my, your eyes more, to see him better, to see him clearer. Um, but at the same time, Jonathan Edwards was really big in spiritual disciplines as well. Read the Bible, pray, because through these things, God opens our eyes more. So through reading the Bible, through prayers, through uh, the preaching of the gospel, we're, it's still God opening our eyes, but God does it through spiritual disciplines, if that makes sense. Does he use the language of means of grace? Yes, means of grace, yeah. Just like how. I mean, it reminds me of, I think, it's all these words, work out make every effort work out for me. Yeah. Yes. 
paid with not our working will entirely. And so we yeah. experience those things on top of each other rather mm. than in opposition to each other. Mm. Mm. Um, also, I think back in the day, busy talking to someone about it. But <laughs> 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 like um, the so book. That's a good what, what, what's, um, who, who wrote the book? Um, hum, lonely and gentle and lonely. Yeah, he also wrote a book uh, deeper, which talks about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I was reading the verse that Mosh, Mosh reference. Maybe we'll close with that. Yes. Um, all right. I think a good uh, verse that I think yeah Mosh could, well chosen that that captures that. Um, uh, I don't know what the word is. Com compatibilism is the the modern word. Um, Philippians 2, from th 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So you work, and God works. Amen.